Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, Telematics What Next, um, sponsored by Verizon Connect. My name's Ross Morlock and I'm one of the directors here at Break and part of Break's global fleet team, where we work with fleet operators and suppliers to share resources and best practice across the industry. You should all now be able to see my presentation and hear the audio alongside it. As attendees, you're all muted, so you don't need to worry about any background noise from your offices. Telematics is an ever-growing market. With so much technology on offer, where should you look to invest your budget and time? And how can you make sure you're getting the most out of the technology? Today's webinar will explore how you can ensure staff understand and engage positively with telematics, and the importance of getting useful data from your telematics, and how to respond to telematics data effectively. Best practice case studies will be presented um, by companies that have successfully used telematics to improve safety and save money. I'm delighted to, to welcome our speaker lineup today. And um, we're welcoming David Lawrence, Marketing Manager at Verizon Connect, Salim Kavanagh, CEO at Ingenie Telematics, and Sam Futter, Strategic Partnership Director at Intelligent Telematics. All of today's presentations are pre-recorded, but I'm delighted that all of our speakers are joining us live today to answer any questions you may have. There are two ways to put forward your questions to us. Firstly, there is a chat box on the webinar panel where you can send your question at any point during today's webinar. Alternatively, there is a raise hand icon on the same panel. You can press this during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentations and we will unmute you. And you can put your question to the panel then directly over the phone. Before we start with the first presentation, I just want to take the opportunity to give you a very brief overview of Break, who we are and what we do. So Break was set up and founded in 1995. We're a national road safety charity that exists to stop the needless deaths and serious injuries that happen on roads every day. We want to make streets and communities safer for everyone and care for families bereaved and injured in road crashes. Our vision is, is quite simple. Um, a world that has zero road deaths and injuries and a world where people can get around in ways that are safe, sustainable, fair and healthy. We promote road safety awareness, safe and sustainable road use and effective road safety policies through uh, campaigns, community education, information and advice for organisations operating fleets of vehicles and road safety professionals. And of course, by running the UK's flagship road safety event, Road Safety Week, which takes place in November every year. We also provide essential support to people across the UK devastated by road death and serious injury to help them in their darkest hours. So in terms of support, we run a quality accredited free phone helpline in the UK for people bereaved and seriously injured in road crashes. You can see some information on the level of support we gave in 2017 on your screen now. In addition to the helpline, we also provide support literature and work very closely with police forces throughout the UK so that when someone does receive that knock on the door from a family liaison officer, they're providing them with best practice support literature. We also campaign nationally and regionally to raise awareness among the public and to lobby government and push for change in road safety legislation. An example of this is our 2016 Roads to Justice campaign which centred around getting justice for bereaved families. This UK campaign launched outside Parliament and gained a lot of media attention. And I'm sure most of you will have seen the changes to criminal driving sentencing announced in October 2017. We are, of course, now lobbying the UK government to make sure those changes are properly introduced. We also do a lot of campaigning more generally on raising awareness of a range of topics, some of which you can see on screen now. Awareness raising and education in communities is delivered through projects such as our Beat Beat Days and Road Safety Week. Each year, Break helps hundreds of companies run road safety projects in their communities and inspire children to be safe on our roads. We have well established events and resources to help you run activities locally to your business. Our community engagement team can help put you in touch with local schools and nurseries and give you advice on how to talk to different age groups or your company can work with Break to establish your very own community project. This year, Road Safety Week is taking place on the 19th to the 26th of November and our theme is Bike Smart, focusing on the safety of 
each on two wheels, both cyclists and motorbikers. Please visit roadsafetyweek.org.uk to register for your free action pack. And please make sure you sign up to our Taking Part in Road Safety Week webinar, which is taking place in September. As you can see on screen now, we also share training tools um, and guidance on global fleet safety best practice through our Brake Professional Membership Service. We provide our members with tools to manage occupational road risk, regardless of budget, fleet size or vehicle type. We run an annual calendar of events, including webinars such as today's and seminars and training throughout the year. We also have annual flagship events such as our Fleet Safety Conference and Fleet Safety Awards. In addition to these events, we also produce a lot of resources for employers, including guidance reports on introducing policies and sharing best practice case studies. Alongside that, we provide employers with tools to use directly with their drivers. As you can see on screen now, some of the posters and infographics and videos you can use to engage your own drivers. If you have any questions or would like to find out how you can get more involved with us here at Break, please let us know. Uh, the presentation today will last for approximately 45 minutes. And as I referred to earlier, there'll be plenty of time to ask any questions at the end, um, should you have them. We are recording the webinar today um, and the recording will be made available to you. Without further ado, um, we'll start the first presentation now. Um, so I'll hand you over to David Lawrence from Verizon Connect. So uh, thanks to the break team for organizing today's webinar. The subject of telematics, what next could cover a multitude of to different topics and directions. But we hope to update you on what is new in the market right now and give you a flavor is what's just around the corner. And in a later session, I will cover off how gamification can help to improve driving standards for a safer fleet. Both sessions will address business and safety issues, proving that concentrating on safety can drive positive change to the bottom line too. I hope you can use some or all of the content. It might help to stimulate thoughts in your business planning for future developments or to kickstart improvement plans. Given the title of our webinar, we'll make certain assumptions that you already have a basic working knowledge of telematics and the benefits it brings to businesses, both large and small. Hopefully you already know that telematics is a way of understanding the location of your vehicle, which in practice allows you to resource efficiently for new jobs or even how to reallocate resources when planned jobs overrun. It also assumes that you have a handle on the cost and safety benefits that come from monitoring and improving driver behavior. I hope you can indulge me for a moment as it's worth understanding product life cycles to give some context to this section. There are a number of stages that both consumers and businesses go through in a product life cycle and they fall into the following categories. Innovators, that's the people that must have the latest technology as soon as it's available. Early adopters are next, and they will wait a short time to ensure that there is evidence that new technologies are robust, but ultimately they will embrace the benefits of digital technology early on. Following the have that, uh, not unsurprisingly, the majority, that's most people who wait to invest once a technology has become mainstream. And then last but not least, you have the laggards, who will always be the last of the party, at which point the innovators have probably moved on to the next big thing. A word of warning here, and hopefully part of your motivation for joining today's presentation. Laggards include companies such as Blockbuster. They had the opportunity to buy Netflix, Toys R Us, who ignored the Amazon online business model, and Kodak, who failed to embrace digital photography as a viable challenge to printed photos. All three companies failed to realize the challenge and opportunity that digital technology affords, a fact that was at the forefront of the plans of their more forward-thinking competitors. Please forgive me then if I spend the next few minutes concentrating on what early adopters are either reviewing or implementing so that you can get a very real sense of where your business could go to stay ahead of or at least keep up with the pack. I'd also like to give you a window into what innovators are already eyeing up and what's around the corner so you can get a more long-term view of connected vehicles and telematics. Let's look first at vehicle tracking, the classic and best known function of telematics. If we take for granted that companies already employ telematics to use the insight on vehicle positioning to deploy their drivers in the most efficient manner and where necessary throughout the day adjust their resources based on new jobs or delays in current or planned jobs, what advances should we now expect that will benefit businesses and their customers? The answer is greater real-time interaction with FID staff, which in turn improves job accuracy and planning, leading to increased customer satisfaction. Customers will no longer accept spending a whole day waiting in for a delivery or service appointment, nor should they. With the use of mobile phones as a gateway to communicate with staff, not only can jobs be planned days, weeks, or even months in advance, 
Instant communication allows variables such as traffic and weather issues to be factored into a working day, providing updates to SatNav and routing on the go. An example of recent advances in the huge amounts of information powered by the Internet of Things. Historic traffic data can now be factored into a working schedule so that traffic black spots can be anticipated in advance, with schedules and routes adjusted to factor in potential delays. Con effect for customers is that they can and should expect that they will be given accurate and updated information on appointments to time windows as low as half hourly slots. Smartphone development means that staff no longer need any specialised hardware to communicate with the office. The development of intuitive and free to download apps on phones and tablets means they are connected to the business at any point in the working day. At a more basic level, vehicles have historically been fitted with aftermarket hardware, which adds cost and potential downtime to businesses. Just about every vehicle manufacturer nowadays has a plan to make telematics hardware a standard fit on the new models they release. You'll see this in vehicles released by the end of this year, and it will become the norm over the next two to three years until it is as commonplace as built-in audio equipment or ABS. Doubtless, one of the highest priorities for fleets has to be the safety of their drivers and the public around them on the roads that they drive on. There is a well-known expression coined by Peter Drucker, you can't manage what you can't measure. You will hear over the next few presentations various facets that help to drive improvements across the board, all of which will allow you to measure what was until recently impossible to quantify and therefore check your progress on improvements. The introduction of and developments in gamification will help to serve as a tool to encourage safer driving behaviours. Likewise, camera integration can prove invaluable in determining cause and liability in any incident scenario, whilst also providing additional motivation for drivers to behave more safely. Recognising risk patterns can help form decisions on when to provide drivers with appropriate training. Any combination of the above can help to drive bespoke improvement plans, which benefit businesses twofold, as they both provided targeted training that's right for each driver, whilst lowering the overall cost of driver training, because there is no longer a need to provide blanket training for all based on the lowest common denominator. Again, all these insights can be used as a tool to drive continuous safety improvement. There is a quiet revolution in telematics and it surrounds the increasing amount of information available and the ability to bring previously disparate information under one roof. Huge amount of information are generated every day, even by smaller fleets. Trying to make sense of all the information available, let alone trying to make it work in a meaningful way that truly benefits companies, can seem like a mountain too hard to climb. You can see on screen now a list of various technologies that have up to now been standalone, requiring expensive and time-consuming APIs, which may or may not work to varying degrees. Integrating all this information to a single platform allows businesses to simply feed the machine with the work to be done and the available assets and people. Through the magic of cloud computing, out pops a schedule for the next day and all the management reports that will help drive a business forward. It should not be underestimated, though, that clear thoughts and goals should be defined at the outset of any such integrated approach to get the best possible outcomes. What drives these decisions should always centre around your customers and an improved level of service. A happy customer is, after all, a loyal customer. I mentioned a little earlier the oncoming wave of vehicles that will come with standard fit telematics hardware. Having a manufacturer fitted solution creates many increased possibilities for a more efficient, lower cost and safer fleet. Information generated on vehicle health can benefit a company's bottom line costs as well as provide additional insight into safer driving. On the former, it is now possible not only to read fault codes but provide meaningful interpretations that can drive informed decisions. From such basic information as low oil levels or selective catalytic reduction fluid such as AdBlue, fleet managers can now speak to drivers about warning lights and notifications at the earliest onset. Much easier to get a couple of litres of oil now and to wait a week and go through the hassle of replacing a seized engine. Even more critically, knowing if your driver is wearing a seatbelt or has an airbag to deploy are essential to ensuring a driver's safety. I promise to view into the near future too, so here are a few developments in the industry to keep an eye out for. It's not just light and heavy good vehicles that will benefit from telematics. Manufacturers are looking to fit telematics hardware to cars too. There is, after all, as much duty of care for employers to monitor and look after their company car drivers as there is for their commercial vehicle drivers. The vehicle is a hub. Part of car connectivity is a GPS hardware and mobile SIM cards that drive current telematics offerings. But manufacturers are now making vehicles truly connected by adding in Wi-Fi, which means that vehicles can now be a hub for information, not just for infotainment, but as a mobile office on the go, obviously while stationary and not whilst driving. 
Much is talked in the press about autonomous vehicles, and you can get a broad difference of opinions as to how long it will take for our roads to be populated by self-driving cars. Whilst we wait for that day to come, more practically our roads should become safer with the interim steps to full autonomy becoming more prevalent. They include driver assistance technologies such as collision avoidance and accident prevention. Already a feature on high-end cars, these technologies will filter down over the next few years to more mainstream models and commercial vehicles too. Just around the corner is Ecall. Again, it already exists in high-end cars, but any vehicle manufacturer looking for type approval on new models from the 1st of April this year needs to include this as standard, so you can expect them to become the norm over the next few years. Now, driver fatigue is also a major cause of concern for any driver and their employer. Whilst most companies have a policy in place to ensure that drivers are not behind the wheel for too long, technology also has answers for the fatigue detection, either by monitoring driver reactions and steering behaviours, or by even the more sophisticated systems that monitor skin and blood flow indicators. Either solution should give warnings before drivers get into dangerous situations. Perhaps the most exciting application for the future of vehicle telematics is the event of CV2X, uh, otherwise known as Commercial Vehicle to Everything. This is the latest acronym to appear in the connected vehicle world. And in short, it's the culmination of all Vehicle 2 technologies, such as Vehicle to Vehicle, whereby vehicles communicate with each other, providing the information needed to anticipate actions, such as impending lane change. As part of the same stable of burgeoning technologies, V2I, or Vehicle to Infrastructure developments, hold much promise. For V2I, it's not just cars that are getting smarter, it's the cities they drive around too. Smart cities will be able to communicate with cars to ease traffic flow and optimise parking opportunities. V2 platforms will even allow communication with pedestrians through V2P infrastructure. In short, the future of telematics and connected vehicles holds much promise for a safer and more efficient world. Just remember, as these technologies start to make their way into your fleets, it's your responsibility to ensure that the promise that they hold can only be realised if managed and communicated effectively. Thank you very much, David. Um, a really insightful introduction there to um, today's webinar. Thank you for that. And we'll be, as you get a, a sneak preview there um, from the slide on screen there, we'll be um, coming back to, to David um, a little bit later on for, for, for part two um, of, of, of his presentation. Um, next up, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Salim Kavanagh from um, Ingini Telematics. I um, was going to talk about um, using telematics to recognise risk patterns and develop positive um, interventions. Um, Salim, over to you. Welcome to the break webinar on positive intervention. Uh, my name is Salim Kavanagh, CEO of Ingini a well-known telematics retail brand and B2B platform for insurers, fleets and other companies globally. So a bit uh, about Ingenie's history. Uh, we believe we were the first to launch a successful telematics proposition into the UK market some seven years ago. Since that time, we have gradually refined the proposition, improved our customer features and have subsequently launched a B2B version of the platform. On this slide, I have detailed our consumer process. This is a useful introduction to how we interact with our customers with the aim of improving their driving behavior throughout their time with Ingenie. One of the keys to improving behavior is the opportunity to obtain discounts to their annual premium. For a young driver, this is a significant sum and represents a large reward for improving their driving beyond the norm. Specifically, this is calculated at three moments during the policy year. For different customer segments though, the rewards can be varied dependent on what motivates that group to improve their driving. To provide information that is predictive of risk and claims requires very granular driving behaviour data. Customers have to believe what they're being told is correct. And as in rare cases, policies may be cancelled, the decision taken must be highly accurate. Unusually for this sector, Ingini collects driving behaviour data 10 times a second, primarily to capture cornering very accurately. We have found that poor cornering in combination with other factors is highly predictive of actual insurance claims. Next slide, this shows the connection between driving score and risk. The graph reads left to right with a higher score, say 100, representing a very good driver. The top blue line shows a steep decrease in claims frequency with improvements in the driving score. Unsurprisingly, this is mirrored with the orange crash frequency line below 
other claims not dependent on customer driving behavior, such as windscreen, show a low correlation. Overall, though, the Ingenie driving behavior score is highly correlated with insurance claims and actual crashes. Slide six, Ingenie in the early days decided to do something about poor driving by our customers. We believe that telematics was not just about winning through self-selection, i.e. the best drivers coming to you, but as the telematics insurance policy became the first choice for young drivers, also helping those customers become less risky whilst they're with us. The graph on this page shows when our driving behavior unit intervenes versus other forms of less intrusive intervention. When driving is good or medium risky, then feedback is automated and designed to help customers understand how to win a discount. When drivers enter the more risky red zone, we intervene at that stage using the driving behavior unit. The DBU team, the driving behavior unit team, and Gini are all trained psychologists to degree level. The tone of voice and interaction is designed to be interactive and aimed at coaching customers. We have found this is the best way to motivate people and get them to actually change their driving behavior. The aim is to get them to change behavior quickly before a crash occurs. The coaching itself pulls on several motivating factors. Over time, we've used driving behavior data and claims data to refine the interaction and the methods used to get the largest improvements in risk across the whole book. Ingenie developed the DBU process based on a well-known process called the trans-theoretical change model, uh, well-known in psychology circles anyway. At the point of contact, a customer can be in three states, unaware of the issue, which is very common, unconcerned by the issue, possibly not motivated by the policy discount, or ready for change, received and digested info in the app, but needing coaching to actually motivate and do the change. After the call, the customer enters a review period and the driving behavior is monitored to see if they've improved and maintained the post-call balance we often see. If not, they'll receive another call and so on uh, until they improve. I'm now gonna play um, a brief clip of a call. You can hear how we do it, you can hear kind of responses and the things that we aim to, uh, to actually get. So I did just want to go over one of the examples um, briefly on the phone. Um, so this is down Huddersfield Road. I don't know if you're familiar with um, with sort of the road at all. It's near sort of Shelley area. Yes. Yes. I don't think really, yeah. Yes. Okay, so um, on this actual road, there is a speed limit sort of going, um, you know, from the 30 section to the 40. Um, on the 40 section, we have recorded speeds up to 69 miles per hour. 69? Yes, yes. Oh, my God. So, you know, it is, you know, a lot over the speed limit, so you can see why we were concerned. Yeah, okay, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I think, I think I'm afraid. Since I've had that red, and obviously now I'm in this car, yeah. I think um, the right foot's going to be a, a lot lighter on the accelerator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. hope that was useful to everybody listening. Um, I hope that was an interesting and useful introduction to the DBU process. We believe it has given us the lowest risk profile in the UK young driver market, and several insurers have confirmed this uh, to us. Um, this slide shows further detail and confirms the benefits of our DBU process. One of our advisors will actually speak to 50 customers a week, which is 2,400 a year. Over 90% of our customers improve their driving with specific attributes for into speed of over 91.8%, braking at 84, 5.4% and cornering at 77%. Over the next six months, we're intending a big refresh on data-driven improvements using artificial intelligence to predict the best mix of intervention and rewards. On a large insurer's business or a large fleet, this will drive a significant improvement across the whole population. So where does this leave us with commercial or fleet business? Putting aside insurance for a minute, we know that fleets are very focused on ensuring that drivers are licensed to drive, they're well trained, aware of their responsibilities, and when they're out there, the risks of accidents are reduced. There are many fleet telematic solutions available that are focused on route planning, claims, identification, and fuel or maintenance efficiency. We intend to pull these worlds together by integrating existing data being collected from devices already installed into an effective behavioral change system. 
This would be a combination of online training, call driven intervention, or actual driver training in the car. Over time, fleet managers can track improvements to behavior using the management information provided, see which drivers are responding well to intervention and change intervention types if one approach is not working. This approach would also allow a rewards-based system to be deployed where the best drivers or improvers in a given month would get employee benefits. The improvements this would drive could be worth a significant percentage of a business's net margin in terms of financial benefits. The next iteration would be a pack that could be shared with a fleet insurer to reduce the cost of insurance by proving the fleet manager is positively engaged with reducing risk through proactive driver engagement. Thanks for listening, and hopefully you will have some insight into how positive driver engagement can reduce driving risk. Thank you, Salim. I think some really um, interesting examples um, that I think have brought brought the subject to life, but also shown how um, you know fleet managers in particular could be using the data that they're collecting. So thank you very much for that. Okay, and um, we now go back to um, David at Verizon Connect um, for part two of his presentation. So David, I'll hand, hand over to you. Thanks to the team at Break for giving us the opportunity today to look a little more closely into the latest trends in telematics and the benefits of gamification and how it can help both improve safety and help businesses save money. I hope today I can shed a little light on what gamification is and how it could help to bring up minimum standards of driving in your fleet. As progressive businesses have become used to telematics and the cost and safety benefits that it provides, there can often be a challenge on how best to engage with the drivers that will be monitored, whether that be via telematics, in-vehicle cameras, or possibly both. Everyone is different and all fleets will experience a range of differing attitudes to monitor driver performance. But experience tells us that the more information you give to the driver, the less work needs to be done to sell in the benefits. So the big questions to answer are, how can drivers feel included and trusted in the process? And what are the benefits to them personally? The answer is to find a way of making the information produced by telematics relevant and interesting. This is where gamification comes in. Simply put, the ability to gamify means that all drivers can access their performance in a format that stimulates improvements and friendly competition in an easy to understand format. Gamification provides a platform in which drivers can monitor themselves and their performance compared to their peers. It effectively promotes self-policing and provides each driver with their own carrot or stick, depending on their individual performance and motivation. Now, some drivers show great pride in being the best that they can be. A certain element of competition to be the best will see them perform consistently, especially when their efforts are recognized and possibly rewarded. Conversely, those drivers who may have historically displayed a won't-be-told attitude can no longer hide in the shadows free to do their own thing. The visibility that gamification provides now puts a spotlight on their performance and any opportunity for self-improvement, hopefully before management intervention is required. After all, nobody likes coming in last place. So how does it all work? What has made gamification possible over recent years is improvements in technology, specifically the seemingly unstoppable rise of smartphones. They are a fairly ubiquitous business tool and a piece of hardware that your drivers are already used to interacting with every day. Having access to the hardware in your driver's hands is what is key, as it allows you to ensure that you can communicate relevant information with them regularly and easily. It should go without saying that interaction with smartphones should only be done whilst not driving for the obvious safety, legal and compliance reasons. There is a wealth of information available and sometimes it's hard to know where to start. So if you're not sure what driving habits to measure, there are some basic indicators of risk that low performance drivers can make quick improvements on. Some of the more fundamental ones include speeding. Now, if you've seen one message from brake that hits home time and again, it's speeding. Increased speeds mean less time to react and longer braking distances, all major contributors to the frequency and severity of road accidents. Harsh acceleration and braking. Both these activities not only use additional and expensive fuel, but they also again increase risk as they cut down on reaction time. Use of seat belts. You would think that such a basic safety feature would be a second nature for all drivers in today's safety conscious society. Yet in the last available report in 2014 from the UK government, it was reported that nearly 5% or 4.7% to be precise of vehicle occupants were still not wearing a seatbelt. If you exclude cars, taxis and private hire vehicles, this figure goes down to only 82.9% for occupants in the driver's seat, which should be a serious concern, especially for fleets running commercial vehicles. 
The good news on this point is that many OEM telematics systems also now include the ability to monitor seatbelt usage. And this will increase over the coming years as manufacturers start making telematics a standard feature in both cars and commercial vehicles. It should not be underestimated that changing employee habits and even company culture can be a big task. To reap the benefits that drive safer driving habits bring, telematics should by necessity become part of your driver's daily routine. If it doesn't, it runs the very real risk of becoming just another passing fad. We've all likely seen initiatives from an employer that go all out for a couple of months and then dwindle away to a nice to have or even worse forgotten and then to nothing. Such well-intentioned improvement programs by management or HR help to pull the company in the right direction, but they often get replaced by the next big idea. Now, that's not to say that all such initiatives don't work, but it's a real challenge to ensure longevity for any improvement program. We all know that risk remains a constant and therefore driving safely must remain a priority day in, day out with any business. It's not a fad and therefore ensuring that drivers remain interested and engaged is no small feat. So this is where gamification comes in. By applying the principles of gameplay, i.e. scoring points and competing with others, you can keep a regular check on drivers in a format that they can easily interact with, whilst making use of their natural curiosity and competitive nature. Opting your drivers into a coaching app means for the first time they can get visibility into their own driving habits. Once they know which areas they need to improve, they can make a conscious effort to work on them to continue to track their own progress on a regular basis. Also, by benchmarking themselves against their peers, it is easy to introduce a friendly, competitive environment with the more engaged staff striving to be the best they can be, or conversely, highlighting those drivers who may little more attention or coaching. In either scenario, the consistent updating of data serves to highlight performance over time. For the self-motivated drivers, desire to always be or near the top is a matter of pride and healthy competition, and adds a further level of motivation supporting the habit of making increased driving safety and everyday routine. At the other end of the scale, nobody expects that drivers will en masse change their habits overnight. But as companies come to realize that minimum levels of safety are a must by shining a spotlight on underperformance, achieving acceptable base levels of safe driving and behavior can be realized. Once that base level is achieved, then further improvements can be made over longer periods. Don't be too ambitious though. Try and make minor adjustments, say once a quarter, and have an end goal in sight too. If you don't know where your final goal is, how will you know when you've got there? You could start by reducing speeding to say at a maximum of 10% over the posted speed limit. Then in the following quarter, assuming you've reached your initial target, you could highlight harsh braking and the quarter after that harsh acceleration and so on. It's also worth noting that different drivers are motivated in different ways. It may be that it is enough to know for some that their employer is concerned for their safety. Others may like the competitive nature of being the best or achieving top scores compared to their peers. However, it is also possible for a significant number of drivers to be contemplating the nagging question of what's in it for me. Whether they voice this or keep it to themselves is much down to company dynamics as it will be to individual personalities. It should, however, be a consideration when scoping out how to engage with drivers early on in both pre-launch and implementation processes. Experience again tells us that early consultation with drivers and an inclusive dynamic in the planning process helps engagement and adoption of updated driving policies. Where these programs work best is when companies recognize and reward their staff for individual and team improvements. It is a quick win for any company that wants to make real measurable improvements and encourage a minimum standard of driving over the long haul. You may be pleasantly surprised to know that this doesn't have to cost much money, if any at all. What is important that is success and achievement are recognized and celebrated. Some of the most successful companies recognize that a byproduct of safer fleet is a more efficient fleet. As such, you could consider diverting some of the fuel savings to reward performance. Options include rewards either to high-performing individuals, remember those drivers who want to be the best, or perhaps a more all-encompassing reward scheme based on achievement against a target will work better, especially if you have a number of lower-performing drivers trying to make the grade to bring up minimum standards. This could be further be enhanced by increasing levels of reward or recognition categorized by bands of achievement. So, in summary, what have we learned today? Well, the more you engage staff early on in the process, by great, the greater your chances of staff buy-in and engagement will be. By giving drivers personalized information, they can police themselves and benchmark their performance against their peers. 
consider summing use the fuel and possible insurance savings to create the continuous rewards program. If in doubt as to the best route, reward achievement for all for reaching minimum standards. Be consistent and don't try to make massive changes overnight. Work on a plan to make incremental improvements over months or quarters. Target the main issues first, like speeding. Be very careful about your goals and motivation. Safety is not a fad and you need to commit to the long term. Lives could be at stake if you ignore your responsibilities. So in closing, gamification is a real answer to a very real problem and it's available now as a viable solution for long-term success. By the use of coaching apps, you can ensure drivers are always driving safely and are at the top of their game. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, David. Um, lots for us all to, to think about there. Um, and it'd be really interesting, I think, to, to hear from any of today's audience around you know, whether you've implemented anything similar to, to what you know, David has outlined and perhaps you know some of the successes of that so please please do get in touch whether that's part of today's webinar or or afterwards that'd be really interesting thank you our final presentation today um, is from Sam Futter at Intelligent Telematics Sam is going to talk us through um, a case study so we'll, we'll hand over to Sam now uh, good afternoon everybody um, I'm delighted to be invited to um, participate on this webinar uh, by um, Break um, in conjunction with one of our um, partners, uh, Verizon. Um, the presentation will be uh, available um, to download and view, and I will be available to um, answer any additional questions you may have at a later date. Um, I'll start off by giving you some um, background um, information on our uh, company. Um, intelligent Telematics, um, now known as um, SureCam, um, it's, it's been started about five years ago and the reason that the company started was that we saw that there was a, um, a real need in the market for a connected uh, vehicle dash cam as it's probably well known as. Um, traditionally fleets in the UK operated dash cams using um, SD card technology. Any camera is good for sort of, um, you know, protecting your um, drivers, um, seeing what's happened in the event of an accident or an incident. But the problem with SD card cameras was the fact that you had to go to the device to uh, retrieve the SD card. Um, this wasn't always practical for a fleet that was perhaps operating out of um, hours cross border as an example. SD cards were often um, corrupt, so the video footage wasn't um, captured. And in the event of a kind of sort of serious accident or incident, um, you know, for managing the driver um, duty of care, you really needed to have access to the video footage straight away from the scene um, and this is one of the reasons that um, Intelligent Telematics launched the first 3G vehicle camera in the UK. Um, so we're a market leader um, offering connected camera vehicle solutions so we can offer integrated uh, driver behaviour video monitoring, FNOL or otherwise known as first notification of loss and proactive claims management and that's integrated within our camera solution and offered by other third party companies that we partner with. We're one of the market leaders in the UK with close to 30,000 live connections, working with a number of well known fleet organisations, road transport and insurance companies. And this is something I'll come on to at a later date in the uh, presentation. We work with um, some of the world's leading um, telematics providers. Uh, Verizon are one of our um, partners in the, uh, the UK and US and we have our head office for the UK and Europe um, in Reading, Berkshire. Uh, we also have our own offices in the USA, uh, Germany and we're operating an international partner network that covers Australia, Africa, Middle East, Asia and South Africa. What is a connected uh, vehicle camera. Um, there are a number of um, camera solutions um, available to the general public today um, from various companies, um, from your sort of standard dash cam that you can buy from Halfords to the more kind of sort of complex um, system 
that you can buy from companies such as Intelligent Telematics and other similar companies operating in our space. So what is a connected camera? Um, well, first and foremost, it's hardwired to the uh, vehicle um, ignition. Um, this is a pretty straightforward process. If we have a trained installer um, engineer, this should probably take 35 to uh, 40 minutes. Um, that offers you that kind of sort of um, security, knowing that the system's hardwired. Some companies um, offer um, adapters that can be added to cigarette lighters, as an example. But this isn't something that we recommend because that's open, that's open to um, um, tampering from the uh, driver or third party within the vehicle. Fitted with our um, camera, um, whether it's a 3 or 4G um, system, is a uh, data SIM card. The SIM card enables the um, operator of the um, system to view the video footage instantly from the scene. So when the camera um, triggers an event over the 3 4G network, the connectivity will enable you to stream the video and look at that pretty much instantly. Other parts of a connected vehicle camera solution are the uh, integration with third party companies that um, offer um, incident detection and, and crash detection. Um, most of our um, telematics um, partners provide this part of the uh, solution. And we're also um, linking into video monitoring services, proactive claims handlers that can offer um, FNOL, which is where you really see your return on investment. It's all about managing that video um, evidence from the scene as quickly as possible, which will assist our customers in reducing their average claims cost that has an ultimate um, effect on their um, insurance premiums. That's where they're seeing the savings. And of course, from sort of breaks perspective and from a sort of a fleet manager's perspective, being able to have that video immediately from the scene um, enables us to manage any accident or um, incident as quickly as we possibly can. You'll notice that there's a diagram on this slide that tells you or explains in more detail how the uh, system integrates. So our customers, we have a number of um, uh, well-known customers um, operating in the fleet world and transport world within the UK. Um, there's some familiar brands on the screen there. G4S is a, um, a recent um, customer of ours, we're proud to say. Um, they have many reasons for using the, uh, the camera system. Security aspect is, is one of those. The system is um, configured and integrated with a remote panic trigger button that the driver can press. That will automatically send foot video footage straight back to the, um, to the fleet manager. A couple of other companies on their GBA um, services, as an example, they operate um, cross-border. So their drivers will travel from the UK over to France and other countries within Europe. So being able to uh, monitor and manage their drivers traveling overseas is, is, is very important. Um, again, if there's been an accident or an incident, the camera will trigger the alert, send the video footage through, and along with the GPS coordination, the fleet manager can identify exactly where the driver is at that point in time, and they can use the video um, footage to um, help manage the um, incident from the scene and you know, call the emergency services if need be, because you can pinpoint exactly where the incident's taken place. Tesco's is one of our largest fleet customers in the UK. We currently have nearly 5,000 vehicles um, with our cameras installed. And they have a real focus on um, duty of care. They want to protect their brand. They want to protect their um, drivers. So driver behavior um, is really important to um, Tesco. So they use the video footage to uh, manage their um, driver behavior initiatives and they've seen a real improvement in driving style since the system has been installed. We have a number of um, um, case studies and again these can be downloaded and, 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 and viewed on the presentation at a later date. 
think this is important because there are a lot of camera companies operating in the UK now. So there's a lot of choice for potential um, buyers of a camera system. So it's important that you carry out some research, making sure that you're buying from the right company. Um, that's a credible organization that can offer you sort of um, good service and support. And it has a proven track record. The case studies are very informative. It's something that we like to um, present and provide to our existing customers and new customers to share experiences as how other fleet users are using the system and you know the sort of the, the benefits and the ways in which the platforms integrated um, within their business um, we're always able to provide um, references to our um, customers along with the um, case studies and in some cases some of our customers are happy for you to visit them on on, on site to speak to them to see how these systems integrated within their business and to share their experiences or how they use the system and the tangible benefits that they've seen from a connected camera uh, solution. Um, we talked about video evidence, which is crucial um, for a number of reasons. Again, on the screen, there's some examples of sort of a third party capture, um, how the video was used to um, um, mitigate a, um, um, a claim against the driver. Fraud, cash for crash is something that's um, quite prevalent in the UK and we've defended a number of our fleet customers with video footage. And I think most importantly from sort of brakes perspective, fleet managers perspective in, in training their um, um, drivers and um, you know helping other road users, um, particularly cyclists, um, this particular um, incident supported a driver in a sort of a, a stressful, upsetting scenario. Unfortunately, the cyclist wasn't hurt, but the fact that we had the video footage instantly, if there was a um, need to call the emergency services, that's something we could have done um, straight away. So there's a number of um, tangible benefits from um, sort of managing these type of incidents as and when they arise. And how it works, the system has a built-in um, GPS and accelerometer. So the GPS will enable you to pinpoint the um, camera asset on the map on our platform. And the accelerometer is very sensitive. Um, if the driver breaches the G-force threshold, uh, which we set for each fleet and each vehicle, because every vehicle is different, um, if the driver harsh brakes, accelerates corners or there's an impact, this will send an immediate notification through to the um, customer, perhaps emergency services, insurance company or broker. You can view that video footage from pretty much 15 seconds from the scene. This and then enables you to um, do a number of things, whether it's working on the insurance claim, um, managing uh, risk, calling in emergency services and just managing that incident from the scene. So that's really, really important. We talked briefly earlier on about um, return on the investment from these type of systems. They can be very expensive when you're looking at hardware costs, the installation costs and the monthly service fees if you're looking at a large fleet. Um, however, if the system's integrated correctly within the business, as we've proven, there are a number of um, tangible benefits and we have demonstrated a return on investment. The information that you've got in the screen in front of you um, has been provided by um, Plexus Law. And this information is based on one of our um, larger fleet customers operating over 4,000 vehicles in the UK. So you can see on the left hand side bubble on the screen that the average cost of claims without a vehicle camera is £1,930. Um, average cost of claim with a vehicle camera is £971. So that equates to £958 saving, approximately 50.3%, which is um, um, quite a lot of uh, money in the grand scheme of things. The next slide just gives you a bit more um, information and breakdown of how the various um, savings have been made via the insurer broker uh, with this particular fleet customer. I think the important thing that we need to kind of sort of talk about and reiterate today um, are the safety benefits. So the cam connected camera system can boost road safety and ultimately save lives. Again, we touched on this earlier on. 
Uh, you can contact the emergency services in the event of a serious accident or incident. Improves driver behaviour through targeted coaching and engagement. Um, mitigate operational risk by identifying poor driving styles. Enhance duty of care and brand uh, protection. We can install the remote trigger and panic um, alarm. It's full HD video quality, um, whatever time of day in any weather condition. So it's really good um, video footage, which is uh, important. And again, it can help protect against cash for crash, stage incidents and false whiplash injuries. Um, so thanks very much for um, listening to um, Intelligent Telematics webinar today. As I said before, I'll be available for um, additional um, questions if you'd like to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. That was great. Okay, so we move on to questions to our Q&A session. Um, we have had a number of questions throughout, um, which we will work through now. If you do have any further questions and it's not too late, please um, submit them um, as per the, the instructions at the, at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so you can type your message in or you can raise your hand and we'll try and get to you. Um, we're just going to um, unmute our panel now. So all of you will be um, unmuted shortly. So first up a few um, for David at Verizon Connect. Um, David, um, is there a risk, particularly with gamification apps, that this technology could encourage at work drivers to check their phones at the wheel? Uh, I, I think it's it's a real possibility if you want to be practical about it. What we tend to find, though, is the the organisations that we deal with uh, are very safety minded in the first place. Obviously, stating the legal side of things, you are not supposed to use your phone whilst driving. Um, what tends to happen is that it's a more of a review situation at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, so that when people are more at leisure or they have a lunch break, that's the time that really they should be checking their phones. Uh, you know, we, we kind of work on the basis that drivers know um, when and when not to use their phones, but there is always the possibility. So I would just stress that if you have a company policy that you just endorse that at the time which you launch gamification programs. Okay, thank you, David. And another one um, for you, David, here as well. Um, when analysing a large amount of telematics data, um, are there particular variables that you would recommend um, that fleet managers consider to identify um, ongoing risks in their workforce? Uh, I, I think you know, I come back to individual companies and the view that they take on you know, what is an acceptable level of driving. Now, some companies have an almost draconian approach to the way that they uh, look at speeding or, or incidents. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that, in that an infraction of one mile an hour over a speeding limit is going to be a, the norm, but some companies actually do that. When you have a lot of information like that uh, and the more... Uh, prescriptive you are about uh, what you allow drivers to do before it becomes an infraction and, and and you can with most gamification platforms you can decide what is acceptable yeah you know, i mentioned in my presentation probably something like 10 percent over the, no, the normal speed limit it is uh, kind of a, a leeway that you'd allow drivers once you start going past that it does indicate a little bit more of a cavalier attitude to driving but you know, just be aware if you do want to go uh, less lenient that you will get more information coming back. And it does make it, it, it practically a little bit more difficult to start wading through all the information. So there's a balance to be had um, compared to, you know, what, what the company finds acceptable overall. Thanks, David. And, and just uh, one more for you um, around, I think it's around kind of the engagement or engaging drivers. Is there a, a risk that low ranking, but, but not necessarily risky drivers could be um, discouraged by the introduction of rankings and is there anything you think that kind of fleet managers could do to try and to try and keep those engaged with, with the process? Um, there is the possibility again you know my presentation said that engaging drivers early on uh, it is definitely a, a better way of approaching all the drivers in the fleet for the lower ranking drivers uh, you know those are the ones that really make the most difference so the more drivers you have in any fleet, the, the, the greater variety of driving styles and attitudes to driving you'll have. But, you know, your biggest gains come from making improvements at the bottom end of, of, of performance. So keeping those people engaged early on and explaining why you're doing things and not just trying to be big brother and use it as, as the stick rather than the carrot. 
um, just you know the explanation that goes through. But you know, as a business, you do have to ask yourself if people consistently perform at a very low level, is that actually something you want to you know to let slip? Um, I, I would suggest probably not. It, it is a time then to take a serious conversation with that driver and, and maybe look at alternatives rather than just the conversation about driver training it gives you then the indication that potentially they should do something possibly online or even uh, you know driving courses etc okay thank you david that's great okay some questions for um salima and genie salim do you have any information on the long-term success of, of of the approach that you outlined with with young drivers yeah well we've been doing it for for seven years now and um, probably got five years of what I call solid data um, of actually measuring how people respond to their different types of feedback, whether it's automated, whether it's via the app, whether it's in-app in gamification, or whether it's the calls for that smaller number of, I guess, problematic people. And um, you can see from there, there's 5% black messages, which is really messages that can lead to cancellation. And actually it's about 2% of our customers that we part ways with during the policy year. So in effect, um, the rest of them are improving to a certain degree. I think on average it's 98% improve. And I think I'd had that table there that said the different types of improvement for braking, cornering, and uh, the other key factors. So in all those risky things, people definitely improve and it is sustained throughout the year because of the, the rewards that they can get. Going into year two of their policy years, we offer them significant discounts based on driver score. Um, and it's a retention tool for us, but also reflects their year two uh, driver risk. And we have a kind of slightly softer touch in, in outer years as well, because we recognize that these are very inexperienced drivers. They've got some experience now. They don't need the same level of, of you know, firm intervention that they have as a very young driver. Uh, but absolutely, you know, we see sustained improvements over time. Um, what I failed to mention on the presentation, I didn't have time, was that connected to a lot of the coaching, there's a lot of uh, content. You know, so so this is how you corner well. This is how you handle different situations on the roads and motorways, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is to for young drivers to get them up to um, to speed very quickly in a very risky environment which is uh, the roads of Britain. I think for, for fleets is a different consideration. I think obviously most of them are experienced drivers, although not all, there's a significant number of young drivers, especially in the last mile sector now who are you know, uh, on our roads driving you know, commercial vehicles. That's a different, slightly different approach. The fundamentals are the same. The gamification is different. Um, things like how do you incentivize people in a long, in a way that change their behavior long term when they're already not doing very well. If you imagine the game Snakes and Ladders, um, there was always a long ladder you could go back up if you'd gone down on the snake that kind of jump you up several levels. And in, in, in gamification terms, you would say that that is like a who is the most improved driver of the month award type stuff. There's something physical attached to that, or something meaningful or financial. So there are ways of incentivizing and using gamification that help all the people on your whole base to actually aspire to be better and less risky throughout the time they're being measured and monitored. Okay, thank you very much. That was a re really good response, thank you. Um, okay, one for um, Sam um, at Shorecam Intelligent Telematics. Do you find that there is, a, is some negativity towards kind of, you know, from, from drivers in particular, Sam, around the introduction of, of, of cameras within their vehicles? Um, it's a good question. Over the last few years, I've really um, sort of noticed a, um, a, a change in a, a driver's view uh, with regards to having a camera um, installed within their vehicle. Um, we often find that um, when we're working with our fleet customers that their individual drivers would have actually purchased a dash cam and installed it in the vehicle themselves. Um, they would have had um, previous um, experience whereby they could have possibly been blamed for um, an accident or an incident that clearly wasn't their fault. Um, so they would often pop down to um, Halfords as an example and store their own um, dash cam. So I've certainly noticed a, um, a change in the market from that perspective. Um, we talked about the kind of sort of the big brother um, 
scenario recently and um, I think it's really important um, to engage and educate the uh, the drivers as quickly as you can um, so what we tend to do is um, produce a, a, a driver communication piece that's sent out to all of the drivers that actually highlights exactly what the system is what it does and how it's there to um, to benefit them and you know once cameras have installed um, quite quickly there's often um, scenarios where the camera footage has protected the uh, driver within the fleet and that information is often fed back and communicated back to their um, colleagues so um, we've noticed a, um, a real change and there isn't really too much negativity now with regards to cameras going into a, um, a fleet vehicle it's something that um, a lot of drivers are now embracing Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Um, another question, a, a fairly technical one for, for you, Sam, around the um, introduction of um, general data protection regulations. Have, has, have the new regulations around data protection had any, any impact on, on the use of cameras at all? Um, it's not really had any um, impact on the use of cameras within our um, business. Um, it's obviously um, opened the door for uh, a number of um, questions and uh, as an organisation we have to make sure that we're uh, fully compliant, which we are. Um, we have an appointed data protection officer uh, at practitioner level. Um, all of our security policies and data protection is up to date. Um, data processing addendums in place with our partners and our data center is um, fully secure. Um, the um, owner of the uh, the dash cam, the camera, um, they actually own the uh, the video footage. That's all secured on our store, on our secure um, service. So we can't actually use that without their um, permission. So it hasn't really sort of slowed down the um, the growth and the demand for um, um, cameras. But um, you know, as I said before, you have to make sure that you're uh, fully uh, GDPR compliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, and one final question. The final question is for Salim. Um, Salim, um, there's a number of parts to this. Um, how did you deal with um, re-offenders where someone had been called and they improved their driving and then slipped back into bad habits? And what circumstances would, um, would you cancel a policy? Yeah, the first question, um, they go into that review period. So if they've already been bad, then they stay in our naughty list for uh, quite a long period of time so we give them extra oversight recognizing that they might slip back again they've only got better because they received a call so they're more likely to get a call a second or third time if they're still on that list uh, and we'll go back to them remind them of their responsibilities etc um, and you know it's not a hectoring tone it's very much a peer-to-peer -peer kind of approach the idea is to get them to understand themselves you know through the grow model through coaching that it's, it's their, their own safety at stake not ours um but yeah that's it they stay in that they stay in that zone until they um stay better for a long period of time um after the first event occurred um so we do we do give them extra attention so what was the second question again it was in what circumstances would you cancel that's policy it, yeah. So um, at the moment, it is through uh, the black messages, which are derived through the scoring. Um, the scoring is for repeated speeding, especially in, in dangerous areas, um, very bad cornering, particularly in combination with speeding. So we actually combine our algorithms, combine all these things together. We know they're powerful risk factors. And if they then ignore uh, the calls they get and um, and uh, continue to do that that they toss out the points above a certain level they get another warning and then they essentially they're, they're cancelled uh, but going forward um, we are uh, also cancelling for one-off events and it would be typically things like driving over 100 miles an hour and so we explain to our, our customers on the way in before they join as part of t's and c's we'll say We'll cancel you for things that you know you will get a severe driving ban for, because that you know the 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 law has decided they're so dangerous you shouldn't really be on the road, and uh, we take exactly the same view. Uh, but I have to say, restate again, it's a very small number. It's two percent. 
The reason why we've gone down this route is we think that most young drivers do want to drive well, they just don't know how to and they need some help. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Salim. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of um, all of our questions today. I'd like to, to thank all of our all of our speakers, um, so David, Sam, and, and Salim. Um, thank you very much for um, for your time today. Um, on screen now, you can see our program of events taking place throughout the rest of the rest of the year. Um, so you can see our, our next scheduled webinars on there. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind you about our Fleet Safety Awards, uh, which will recognise the achievements of those working to help reduce the number of road crashes involving at-work drivers. And whilst the deadline for submissions has now passed, and you can still book your place to attend this year's uh, ceremony, which is taking place in Birmingham um, on the 11th of October, um, please visit uh, fleetsafetyawards.com for more information around that. And please take a look at our Brake Professional website as well for more information about how you can get involved with us, um, how you can become a member of Brake Professional and how you can access all of our um, resources, guidance reports, advice sheets, um, etc. And finally, that just leaves me again to, to thank today's speakers and, um, of course, Verizon Connect for, for sponsoring today's webinar and for their ongoing and continued support. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.